This guy's so good, he makes acting look easy. Millions still think of him as Oscar, and millions more still think of him as Quincy. No matter what role he plays, people love him. He's one of the most talented uh, guys around, Jack Klugman. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Roger. How you doing? Great, great. Tell, let's talk about the voice first, so in case yeah. somebody says, Just, uh, does he have a cold? Yeah, well, they don't worry. They tell him not to worry, but don't worry about it, because <laughs> in about two minutes, you'll think, I always sounded like this. <laughs> Tony Randall said, you never did sound like Richard Burton anyway, so. <laughs> but uh, you get used to it. I just did uh, eight weeks with Tony Randall. We did The Odd Couple, and it got stronger. Never got prettier. It just got stronger, and I'm very happy about that. When did that. you have the, you had throat cancer? Five and a half years ago. I had the operation. I had this vocal cord removed, and it's just a piece of scar tissue there, and I couldn't even whisper. And I met a wonderful guy, Gary Katona, taught me how to exercise at the only, only muscles, and he taught me how to get this strong, this cord stronger so it would meet the other cord, compensate for the other cord not moving, and that's what happened. Wow. And I just did a show at Shining Station in Toronto, and it mm -hmm. came out very well. The so kids show, happy. Huh? Yeah, but yeah. it's a... Uh, a good, a good scenes, and that's what I was interested in doing. So I'm going to come back to work. I know everybody asks you, but are you and Randall friends, Tony we Randall? Are best of friends. We have mellowed, particularly since the operation. Not all the years that we were together. We, were, we always liked each other. We always respected each other. But when I had the operation, he was there all the time. Was he? And he was there in the support. And then he was the one that said, come and do The Odd Couple. He's a wonderful guy. Oh, you know? he's I mean, I, I did a TV show with him a number of years ago called Television, Our Life and Times. And yeah. he's a real pro. Just yeah, terrific. Smart as a yeah. whip. Oh, yeah. You go into a museum with him. He knows what every angel is, the cupid, the arrow. I know. Feel, but he loves to impart it. I know. And you walk out of there, it's like having your own guide. I know. And the price is right, he doesn't charge. Did the did the cancer change your life in any other oh, way? Oh, every way. Every tell me, way. Tell me how you were before, and then when you hit it, and what happened? Well, I was a worry. I was a competitor. I was a, if, uh, be a Russian descent, so if something happened to me that wasn't good, I would carry it and beat my chest for a year. And I, would, I was not resilient. You I weren't did. a happy guy. I was happy in my misery. That's how I got my enjoyment. Oh, poor me, woe was me. And there was no resiliency in my life. But mostly with my kids. I got two wonderful kids. One's 36, one's 31. And I never let them in. When I was in the hospital, my oldest kid was there every day. And I said, David, you don't have to be here every day. He said, Dad, it's the first time in your life you ever let me help you. Oh. And I realized all the times I say, listen, David, I need you to Never mind, I'll take care of it all. David, it's very important of you. No, I'll do it. And I never let them in. And now I let them in, and they let me in their lives, and it's just the best relationship with the kids I've ever had. I couldn't dream to have such a good relationship with them. Isn't that funny? When we're, when we're young and have kids, we're still absorbed in our own our lives, life, and man. we don't focus on kids. I and then know. when they get a little older, it's... You know, they say it's terrible that youth is wasted on the young. It's terrible that parenthood is wasted on the young parent. It's not true, you know, they say the biological clock, but your real clock, the important clock, the, psych the psychological clock is not ready until you've had your life. And you say, okay, I want to devote my life to my kids. But you can't split it. It's hard to split your career, and especially as an actor, you're a migrant worker. Yeah, you have absolutely. to go where it is. So a lot of times you're not home, and, and you're... The ego has and to And you're be angry, you're upset, you're always emotionally up yeah, tight. Yeah, they didn't call you, and you what, what, did you what did your kids tell you about you as their dad? How did they perceive you in those days? Oh, my youngest son has just written a play. I'm going to put it on off-Broadway. I want to tell you, me and my ex-wife, two more villainous people you have never met in your life. <laughs> he was able to get it out, so he'd say, Dad, it's not really you, it's a composite of many people. I said, because you say it doesn't make it true, it's your point of view. And because if you don't say it, it doesn't make it untrue. The only thing I won't forgive you for is if you censor yourself. Put it down. And he did. He, Woo! he laid it into you. He really gave it to me. Thank really? God. I'm glad. It's a good play. Yeah. Can you communicate with your kids now? No, I can't. He's, we talk six hours, five hours a week. Get on the, right. I get a phone bill now that really is murderous. And... We get along so well, they don't even call me collect anymore. You know how good that <laughs> that's, is? That's a great, that's great tribute. I'm not there yet. I, I, I still get the collect calls. Uh, you like the horses. I love them. Well, what it is cost it? me enough. Is it gambling? No, no, no. It's no. not gambling. It started with gambling, but then I became a breeder. I had a horse that was third in the Kentucky Derby. That's great. I mean, you know what that is? That's something like a miracle. And the horse didn't cost me anything, but since then it's cost me a fortune. 
But that you did start going to the track as a gambling. Oh, yeah, track. that's yeah. how I started when I was 16, 15. I went to the racetrack, Garden State Racetrack in Jersey, because I'm from Philly. Right. And uh, the first race I won, I bet on, I won. Oh, that's terrible. But it was, I thought I'd win a million dollars, because I bet about $30 in those days, it was a lot of money. And I went over there with a hat to collect. I think I, I happened to pick a favorite that paid three to five. But it was the thrill of winning. But I've been gambling since I was five years old. We used to play under with pennies and. Did you ever get uh, in trouble by spending too much in gambling? Well, I, I how I became an actor. Really, the truth yeah. is, I, I was a, a gambler. I was into a loan shark. And, oh, you were into a loan shark. I pay him, and I had the GI Bill. And I always wanted to try acting. I never thought I could do it. I thought you had to be somebody special or born a certain way. But I had to get out of t Philly. <laughs> so it's true. And I so I went to Carnegie Mellon. Right. Kind of get tech then, and uh, they had a good theater department I, even then. Right? Yeah, yeah, but when I auditioned, there were 27 girls. I was the only guy who was right 45 right after. I had gotten out early, and so uh, when I went around to see them after the audition, they said, "You are not suited to be an actor. You're suited to more to be a truck driver." But I couldn't go home. They said, "But you see, our problem is we don't have men to do scenes with." But in one semester, we will have them. We may let you go then. I said, it's okay. I figured that'd be enough time for me to get a job and pay them back. But after the first scene that I did, in which I rehearsed and really was a, a, a gangster, and I sounded like a gangster. I'd come from South Philly, I'd talk like this. It, I knew that there was nothing else I could do. I mean, I went on that stage, and I knew that I could do things on that stage that I could not do in life, that I was more comfortable on that stage and believed in myself more there than I did in any social activity outside or social uh, society. Do actors hide in their character? Oh, yes. I think, well, I did. I know that I yeah. did. That's where I found my freedom and I found my courage. In most things, I was cowardly. Really? Uh, but in acting, I never, ever quit. I mean, if I was broke, like I, in 1948, I was working with a director. and. He told me how to say a line. He said, say the line this way. I said, don't do that. Don't tell me how to say a line, because if you are an actor, you can get a job on howdy duty. So don't do it. You tell me what you want, and I'll do it. And I was starving. I needed that 125 bucks, and I didn't work for that guy for 25 years after that. But I never regretted it. That happened all along. That was my life. Acting was my best friend. Were you, were you good from the beginning, or did you... Looking back, were you were you not very good? I mean, did you have a natural instinct? I definitely had a natural instinct of believability, which could work against you if you mm -hmm. don't learn your craft. I was believable, and as a result, I could rely on that. But it's not enough. You've got to learn your craft. Is there a secret to it? I mean, is it that you're not acting in a sense? I mean, that you're really believing what you're hearing yes. in a, in a scene, and that the other person is in the moment, and you're both believing it, or? Is there a technique that can carry you past that? Well, there's technique that can carry you, but that's not the way. It's very simple. I mean, the method they talk about right. is something, sense memory, that you use if you can get it out of the play. But you must and should be able to get it out of the play. And James Cagney said it best. Look the other actor in the eye and tell him the truth. And, that's, and listen. Mm -hmm. Listening is more important. Because my theory is that the other actor, what's happening to him is the most important thing that's on the, happening on that stage, not what's happening to you. And if you go out to them, it'll come back to you, and then it's just a chain of reactions. What about comedy timing? You ever work with a with an actor who had no, 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 no timing? I mean, we're, watching you work with Randall, of course, you guys yeah. seem to feel the rhythm. But I don't know whether it's rhythm or it by that time we had had almost you know 60, 70 years experience in the theater when we were doing that. Right. And I think it's just a lot of experience. People talk about timing. I don't know what that means. Uh, it works. It just, yeah. you listen and you, if you're really playing the scene and you're really in it, it tells you when to react. It tells you what to do. Are horses smart or dumb? I just have to ask this. We have to go to a break here in a minute. But it's kind of dawned on me. A lot of people talk about their animals like, hey, he's really smart. Like he could come in and buy a condo. I have only one thing to say. Do horses bet on people? <laughs> They're smart. They're smart. They're they don't smart. bet on people, right? <laughs> what are you doing now? What are you working on? Uh, you here in New York just... I mean, really, I came here, Tony had a benefit for his right. theater. Right, oh, that's right. So I was there, we raised some money, raised about six, seven hundred thousand. What's the name of his theater? It's the National, National Rep. Actors Theater. Actors Theater, and yeah, it's a repertory. A repertory. It's his lifetime dream, Tony yes. Randall's dream. Isn't and it? he's worked so hard, 15, 16 years, and he's put on some productions that have been magnificent. Right. Diamond of Athens, St. Joan, 
wonderful productions. And he has to struggle. And it's really awful. Yeah, that's terrible. I want to talk about that because we don't invest in the theater in this country, no. and we should. In fact, call Tony Randall and book him on this show because I want to help him promote that and try to help him raise some money. I think it's great. Jack Klugman, we'll be back after these messages. back with one of America's best loved actors, Jack Klugman. Jack, um, we were talking about Tony Randall's theater. Yeah. Uh, he set this up four years ago as his lifetime dream, really, yeah. a repertory company. How does he succeed financially? How does he it work? doesn't. He's given about three and a half million of his own money. He's really? given into it. And he has to go and beg, borrow, and steal. Every goes to every function. We went on to the odd couple for eight weeks. Neither of us took a salary, and the money went to the theater. He just had a benefit. So he spends most of his time doing that. And as I said, I just got back from Vienna, where that small country gives more money to just their opera company, nothing else, just their opera, more money than the entire endowment for all the arts in America. It's not fair. I, I, the, the government here sometimes supports the arts, but by the time the bureaucracy gets done with the money, they don't get too much. That's I've right. always been in favor of tax breaks for people who invest in the theater. Do you Ab think that's a good idea? Absolutely. It's a, there would be twice as many plays. You realize there has been not one new play in a year. There was Showbold, which is a revival. There hasn't been a new play. The Los Angeles in America was the last play that was done. In the old days, they used to have, if you put in, lost your investment in theater, you get a double write-off. Right. Yes. Then they closed that loophole on the theater, but they left it open in gas and oil and other places. Right. And they closed some there, too. But the fact is, if they're going to give it to any industry at all, the American theater seems to me the uh -oh. one that they ought to continue, because you could double the number of shows on Broadway. You could, uh, the tourist industry Actually, would that's boom. That's what I wanted to tell you about that. The, the money would pour in. Oh, yeah. It, it generates more capital. Go to London. They get more money for people going to the theater there. And in New York, they come to the theater. And the more theater there is, the more money is generated. I mean, it should be. Level of acting in America, uh, acting's changed. I mean, if you go back and look at, at films even from the 50s, 60s, uh, today there seems to be a different style of acting. How did you manage through 40 years of acting to keep up with and work with young actors and people without sort of being out of step with the method or the... This well, as I said, there is, to me, there is no method. It's to, just to tell the, look the other actor in the eye and tell them the truth. And there's been no difficulty. In fact, uh, and a good actor is a good actor, no, whatever, no matter what. And if he's had training in the theater, he's at his best. That's where you really... Brando started in the theater. People oh, consider yeah. him a great American actor. He was the best American. He was the most gifted naturally God-given gift he was given, the ability to transmit emotion, not just thought, what he was thinking, but what he was feeling. I saw him in Streetcar in Philadelphia yeah. before it came in, and there's a moment where they, he's eating, and they're talking, and they're putting him down, calling him an animal, and he's just eating. He didn't do anything, and finally, he breaks the dish and says, I cleared my place. You want me to clear yours? I didn't realize that. I was up on my seat. And when he broke the dish, I sat down. He was able to transmit that anger. I mean, that's limpidity. That's really marvelous gift that you're given, the best gift of all. And I saw it 17 times. Whenever I had trouble with a part, I would go and see Streetcar, and I'd be inspired. Really? He was, oh, he was. Any other actors influence you? Anybody oh, you yes. looked at, who'd you? Lee J. Cobb was mm. a great influence on me. You yeah. guys did 12 Angry Men in uh, 1956. Yeah. And tell me about that film. It was made for how much? It was made for $500,000. We all got 900 a week for four weeks. <laughs> and, uh, what a great Henry film. Henry Fonda took no salary, piece of the picture. And Reginald Rose, who wrote it, took no money. But they opened it at the Capitol Theater, 5,000-seater. It's an art film. Nobody came. They never got their money back. Is that right? In fact, Reginald Rose made more money when they made it 12 Angry Women, and it was done in community theaters all over the country. Is that That's right? That's the truth. That's he got more money that Tell way. me about Henry Fonda. What kind uh, of a fellow was he, and then what kind of an actor was he? Henry Fonda was not one of the best, but the best actor I've worked with, and I've worked with marvelous actors, uh, Bogart and Garfield and Cobb. But he really didn't know how to lie. The integrity of this man was apparent. The truth 
the dignity of this man was always there. I'll tell you, I did uh, Mr. Roberts with him, and I got a small part, and I understudied the doc, which is the second lead, and I played the doc for six weeks. The first time I did it was a matinee in Kansas City. He had already done maybe 4,000 performances. A matinee in Kansas City, and at the moment when he comes in and says, transfer me, doc, because he, he's, he's, he's going to miss the war. And he came in, and he says, transfer me, doc, and I look at him, and tears are coming down his face. Like it's opening night, standing room only on Broadway. It's 4,000th performance in Kansas City, matinee. And I just, I went up. He had to save me. I could, it overwhelmed me. He wow. Was, he was the best, the best that I've ever worked Wow. Uh, how about actresses? Who, who have you worked who, who do you really admire, enjoyed working with over the years? Well, I, I only worked with in a lousy film, but I saw yesterday Julie Harris. Right. When I saw her in Member of the Wedding, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, was a big smoker then. That's why the, I got lost my voice. The smoking caused the yeah, cancer. cancer. No and I couldn't wait for intermission, no matter what I was seeing, to go out and smoke. But when I saw a member of the wedding, I sat in that chair and was mesmerized and couldn't wait for the curtain to go up. And I've seen her do St. Joan, and I've seen her do almost everything, Emily Dickinson, everything. She's magnificent. And she's now going to do Glass Menagerie. And I think she's the only one that can do it. I'm next to Lorette Taylor, I've seen many people do it. No one's really cut, cut it the way Lorette Taylor evidently did. When you found out you had cancer, did you think you were going to die? No. No. What I was afraid of, which was the truth, was that I wouldn't be able to act anymore. That was more frightening than dying. Because dying, it's over. What the hell? There's nothing to it. But to be alive and not be able to act anymore, because that's very important to me. Yeah. You'd have to go back and drive a truck after all these yeah. years. Oh. OK, we're going to take another break. We'll be back with Jack Clark. <laughs> we're back talking with actor Jack Klugman, and we we're talking about earthquakes and fires because he lives in Malibu. Yeah. Were you there during the earthquake? Oh, yeah. I've got about 4.30 in the morning. Yet. They make me laugh. Fires scare me, but the earthquake somehow I'd never think except as real. And I, it was the building is shaking, and I look up, and I'm standing under a little jam. How the hell is that going to help me? <laughs> gonna help me. My butt is sticking out. My can is sticking out. I'm going to get killed here. And I'm... I said, it just struck me funny. Really <laughs> That's great. So uh, I understand we have a phone call up. Is it is it up, in fact? Feed it in here. Hello. Hello, Jack. Oh. Uh, whenever I'm on a talk show and they ask me who's the best actor I ever worked with, I say Jack Klugman. Oh, uh oh, uh oh. I meant that. They assume. Actually, actually, he did say that off the air, Tony. Never and then... assume. <laughs> Well, because when you assume... That's right. You make an ass. Out of you... And, and me. And, and me. <laughs> Tony <laughs> Randall, uh, we did a television show together back a few years ago called Television, Our Life and Times, and Jack Parr was on We did on one it. with Jack Parr, yeah. Let's remember that. I sure do. We, we've been talking about your theater. How's it going? It's doing very well, thanks. Uh, you know, we had an auction the other night, and uh, uh, there's an article in today's paper about it. I hadn't quite realized what Jack had done. I had put my Emmy up for auction, and he bought it. And mm -hmm. I didn't know that it, until I read the paper that he bought it in order to give it back to me. Is that true story? So yeah. where is it? Well, it belonged to him. It, something like that. It, we yeah. have to keep everything that we can that proves that we were here and that we produced and were competitive. I know. And so I... All that. I understand all that. Well, that's... But you haven't given it back yet. And what I say is this. You've got three Emmys of your own. What do you need mine for? <laughs> it's because... He told me he had it on his mantle, and he said, that's because Tony isn't worthy. And I, I had no, it on my mantle. I think what he feels is that it, by rights, it's his anyway, because he won it for me. Oh. No, he no, won no, two no. Emmys. No. Wait, but... he won two Emmys for The Odd Couple. I only won one. But he won also an Emmy for the best dramatic actor of the year. So he's won for both uh, serious stuff and comedy. Now, I don't think anyone else theater. has done that. Let's talk about your theater. I'm telling him about them. Don't say how well you're doing because you need money. And That's I'm right. telling him. And, and Roger. He, he said it's going very well, but, but you've you got to raise some dough for that thing. I said that we ought to have uh, tax breaks from, for, for investors in the theater 
because we need more theater. Well, you're right in principle, but I wonder if you would agree on this particular, Roger, knowing you as I do. We should have government support of the arts. Well, absolutely, we do have, but the problem is, by the time it gets through the bureaucrats and committees, uh, the arts don't get the correct no, no. amount of funding. Our entire national endowment okay. is less than what the city of Vienna gives to the Vienna he told, he told us that, but you know what, Tony? The thing is that if you had a, 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 some sort of a tax write-off, the private sector would support it, and they get tax write-offs for other things, so they should do it for theater. They do, but it's not, it's not, a, enough, it's not enough to attract the enormous sun, sums of money we need. What do you and need? To every other government in the world does. What do you need to run your theater? I need seven million a year. Now the Royal Shakespeare and the National in England, both of them, each gets twenty-two million dollars a year from the government, and they were cut back to that. By but Mr. then their Thatcher. government comes to us and borrows the twenty-two million. That's the problem. We ought to just give it to you. No, <laughs> everybody ought to get his share. But what, what should what should be realized is that these two theaters in London are the major tourist attraction of the British Isles. They bring in billions. It's the only tax dollar that makes money. Can you, uh, can you keep that theater going? I've got to. I've got to. That's my life. How'd you get Klugman to work for nothing? <laughs> well, the truth is, he, it was his idea and he offered. He said, we'll go out all summer in The Odd Couple and we won't take a salary and we'll make money for the National Actors Theater. There are very few guys around. I know I'm embarrassing him. Yeah. Very few human beings around like Jack. But I'll tell you something very, very interesting about the man that he won't tell you about himself. Um, having beaten cancer, having gone through just about the worst thing a human being can go through, has changed him enormously. Uh, I know he'll 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 aver what I'm saying, but to others who've known him for years, he's a different human being. How so? Well, it made him into a a total mensch. He, he as he says, he learned what's important in life. Number one is not important. Doing things for others is important. And uh, what is ask, that? Ask ever? him to talk about it. He changed mean? his character. Ever. He's a different man. What does ever mean? Ever. Divert, or what'd you say? He said he'll aver. I said he will aver it. Aver. aver. Yeah. See, he gets so fancy. Then I lose track of what he's talking about. Aver. He's Four letters. A-V-E-R. Okay. Okay. Is that too me. complex for you, baby? All right. Uh, Tony, we'd love to have you on this show and talk about the theater sometime. Yes. yes. Uh, okay. As soon as I get my season set, have me on and I'll, I'll, I'll sell like crazy. Okay, great. Thanks right. for calling in. I love I you, love Jack. Bye-bye. Okay. He's a wonderful guy. Oh, he's is, is he? unbelievable. Where do you that? get that education? He does use big words when you're with oh, him. Oh, right? he knows everything. I'm, I'm telling you, you go to an art museum with him, it's an education. You can spend four days in the Louvre and not learn as much as you can with him in two hours. That's amazing. It's a joy. Well, I've enjoyed having you on. It's Thank a joy. You. It's Thanks a lot. Thank you, Jack Roger. Klugman. Coming up next, author and political analyst Kevin Phillips. Stay with us.